this is our guided notes for the conservation of matter. Okay, so you're going to want to have your book open to page 22. So go ahead and open your books to page 22 right now. Okay, so we're going to start talking about changes in matter, and changes in matter relate very closely to our first learning target, which says, I can differentiate between chemical and physical properties. So we have already used our gestures to learn examples of a physical property, like a freezing point, boiling point, color, texture, hardness, shape, flexibility, and dissolution, and chemical properties like flammability, reactivity, and new substances equals new properties. So when you see these things occur, those are called physical and chemical changes. And that's what you saw when you did your CSI lab. You're actually observing physical and chemical changes. Whenever the powder would dissolve, that's an example of a physical change. And whenever it turned a different color or fizzed, that was an example of a chemical change. So there's two types of changes, chemical and physical. Okay, a physical change is any change that alters the form or appearance of matter. So a physical change is any change that alters the form or appearance of matter, but does not make any substance in the matter into a different substance. Well, a substance that undergoes a physical change is still the same substance after the change. So, for example, you have changes in state. So, remember those changes in state, states of matter. You learned those as sixth graders. We also reviewed those when we were talking about the classification of matter. That's right. It's solid, liquid, and gas. So, changes in state, an example of a physical change would be solid, liquid, gas. Okay, so we know that water can change its form. It could either be a solid, like ice, liquid, like what's in your water bottle, or gas, like water vapor that's in the air, especially when it's humid, like it is in the summertime. You could also have other changes in shape or form, like a sugar water solution, like Kool-Aid. That's an example of a uh, a sugar water solution where you're dissolving the sugar into water it's changing its form okay and becoming a solution if you're bending metal okay like a paper clip if you unbend that paper clip or you bend it in a different way that's showing you a physical change if you break a window what's on the ground well there's still little pieces of glass it's still glass that didn't change uh, the substance it is just in a different form. If you chop wood for a fire, it's still part of a tree and crushing an aluminum can. If you crush the aluminum can, is it still aluminum? Yes. Okay, so let's go on to a chemical change. A chemical change occurs when a substance is transformed into a new substance. A single substance simply changes into one or more other substances. So unlike a physical change, a chemical change produces new, a new substance with properties that are different from those of the original substances. So unlike a physical change, a chemical change produces new substances with properties different from those of the original substances. So when you think back to your gestures, we learn that new substances have new properties. That's what that's saying. 
Okay, so let's take a look at page 24 in your book at the very bottom. You have a table that looks very much like this. Okay, we have chemical changes like combustion. Combustion relates to our gesture of flammability. It's a rapid, rapid combination of fuel with oxygen, O2 is oxygen, that produces light, heat, and new substances. Examples include oil, gas, and coal, like when you burn it in a furnace. Okay. Now, electrolysis is the use of electricity to break a compound into elements or simpler compounds. So for example, you could break H2O, which is water, into hydrogen and oxygen. Okay. The last thing is oxid, or one of the last things is oxidation. So oxidation is the slow combination of a substance with oxygen. So oxygen oxidation. An example of oxidation would be the rusting of an iron fence or even a rusty car. Okay, then we also have tarnishing. So this is a slow combination of a bright metal with sulfur or another substance that produces a dark coating on the metal. Things that could tarnish would be like brass. Like on top of the stairs, there's these little decorative pieces called finials that will are supposed to look bright and shiny and kind of yellow, like a trumpet wood or like a trombone. Those are brass instruments, but these things that are on uh, the stairs don't look very bright and shiny. They have dark coating on it, which is the tarnish. After being exposed uh, to the substances in the air for so long, they've tarnished. Silver, like silverware, uh, if it's true silver, it will tarnish. Most of our silverware now is actually made out of stainless steel to avoid that problem that people had of having your silver always be tarnished. And the last thing that we're going to use as an example is copper. So like penny sometimes can show tarnish or even like the Statue of Liberty. That's made out of copper. So you can see that the Statue of Liberty when it was new, looked more like this, shiny like a penny. Okay, but after time and exposure to uh, whatever's in the air, it has reacted with the copper and tarnished, turned this green shade that you see and that you know the Statue of Liberty as today. Okay, so the next uh, part is the law of conservation of mass or matter. So remember that mass measures the amount of matter using a triple beam balance. So that's why you might hear either name for this law. This law states that matter is not created or destroyed in any chemical or physical change. So you can't create it, you can't destroy it. And during a chemical change, no mass is lost because atoms are not lost or gained, only rearranged. Okay, so for example, methane that's burning. Methane is a gas. For every molecule of methane that burns, 
two molecules of oxygen are used. Okay, the atoms are rearranged in the reaction, but they do not disappear. So we're going to draw an illustration, the conservation of mass using methane. So here's your methane. Okay, you don't have to draw the C and the H and the O in the bottom. That's kind of like my, my uh, atom bank, like you'd have a word bank. So methane is CH4. Plus, I said we needed two oxygen molecules. Okay, so let's put those together. So let's have our carbon. And we need four hydrogen. Okay, we also need two oxygen molecules. Okay, it says to burn methane, we're going to need fire. So we'll draw our arrow and say we need to have a fire. Now this goes to our other part. What happens in the second part of this reaction? You have carbon dioxide plus two molecules of H2O. Okay, so here's our carbon, our two atoms of oxygen. Okay, and we have our two molecules of water. And remember, water looks like Mickey Mouse ears. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm going to make a little dotted line through here because you're showing one part of the reaction versus the other. Okay, just to illustrate that purpose. Let's count up how many carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens we have on each side of this line. Okay, so how many carbons do we have on the left side of the line? Just one. How many hydrogen do you have? Four. How many oxygen do you have? Four. Now on the right side, how many carbons do you have? One. How many hydrogens do you have? Four. How many oxygens do you have? Four. Has anything changed from one side of the reaction to the other? No. So that illustrates the law of conservation of mass or the law of conservation of matter. That nothing is lost, they're still there, but they're just rearranged. The atoms are rearranged. So thanks for listening. If you need anything repeated, please feel free, feel free to rewind.